Hi, this is Devin Orlovsky. Welcome to the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Whether you're watching with our friends over at Torah Anytime or wherever you watch or listen to your podcast, it's always a pleasure to have you along for the experience. Hey, you want to build a studio? How about that? <laughs> now, you don't have to build it from scratch. You could just rent the location and uh, outfit it with all the equipment so that we could raise the level of the Rabbi Orlovsky Show for the thousands and thousands of listeners who listen all around the world. And, uh, you know, we'll have a more permanent location. We'll name it after you or anybody that you want. So uh, if you're interested, please contact uh, admin at rabbiolowski.com. And uh, we'll be happy to have a studio named after you. As you know, uh, we, um, we do things uh, a little bit uh, on the fly over here. And uh, we do the best that we can. And uh, in fact, somebody uh, submitted a question recently. Uh, um, you know, how does the show work and everything? I advise you to go to our third anniversary show where uh, I interview our producer. And I don't think he would be averse if he had a professional studio to work in. So if so... Uh, like I say, we're, we're always happy to. Um, if anyone's interested, if this speaks to you, uh, different things speak to different people. And I happen to know that this is a um, you know, tremendous uh, chizik for a lot of people. But we'd be able to say, from the studios of the Rabbi Olowski show, <laughs> that would be your name. Wouldn't that be exciting? Anyway, just throwing that in. And we have a sponsor for this episode. It's sponsored in memory of Rivka Bas Gavriel Chaim and uh, sponsored by the Freeds and memory of uh, Mrs. Grinberger. And uh, my wife, in fact, grew up uh, with the Grinbergers in the shul. And uh, it was, uh, they're very, very special people. And I'm honored that we can... Uh, dedicate the uh, the show uh, in memory of that yard site. And uh, it should be uh, uh, an aliyah for the neshama, and it should be a schuz for the entire family, who I am not at liberty to go through everything they're going through, but they're going through a lot. And they are wonderful, wonderful people who do so much good work uh, for Klai Yisrael. So it should uh, be an uh, aliyah for the neshama and a chizik for the entire mishpacha, that they should see only simchas. Okay, uh, something I want to talk about, and uh, I'm, I'm going to base it on one of the questions. Yes, you know, we have question and answer at the end, for those of you who don't make it to the end of the podcast. Um, uh, Jay Gelb asks, how does someone stay calm and level-headed when they are frustrated in an agitating situation? So that's what I really was going to talk about this week anyway. When I was looking over the questions and I saw that question, I thought, well, doesn't that tie it in? The question is the following. At the end of Dvarim, it's talking about when you're going out to Mulchama, there is a mitzvah not to be afraid. Yeah? And there's four different lashinas of don't be afraid. Yeah? Don't be afraid, 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 don't panic, don't lose heart. There's all kinds of different lashinas. And uh, Rashi says, because the enemy does four different things. They trample their horses, they bang their shields, they blow shofar and they scream out in human voices. Uh, Rav Desla points out, the one thing they have in common is they're all just sound. Sound and fury and signifying nothing, in the words of Shakespeare. It's just, uh, uh, it's just noise but it frightens us. And uh, it's an interesting thing. You hear a loud noise, you get frightened. What is that? But it's nothing. It's just a noise. People get afraid. We get afraid. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't scary things in the world. Right? Uh, a person who can't pay his bills it's scary. It's a scary thing. People made investments. The investments went bad. The Gemara brings that as an example of, uh, of uh, Tirda, 
where people are worried. I see my ship floundering at sea and I uh, have all my investments in the merchandise on that ship. It sinks. I'm going to lose everything. Oh, well, that's scary. No question about it. Yeah. Um, you're walking down uh, the street in a, in a bad neighborhood like anywhere in New York, and, and you're afraid. You're afraid. I'm not going to tell you there's nothing to be afraid of. We were uh, at the Kaisal. We went to Davin like we, we do in Rosh Chodesh, me and my wife, and uh, I got a little lost wandering through the shuk, areas that we don't usually know. You know, my wife gets nervous. And uh, so I, I, it was very hot. I said, if you want, we can walk around the long way, you know, through the Armenian quarter and through the Jewish quarter. Or we can take the shortcut through the Arab shuk, and it's covered over. So uh, you got to decide. What am I more afraid of, heat stroke or getting killed by <laughs> some terrorist? So she chose the terrorist. So we go through the shock, and it, it's okay, except at some point the sewage was backing up. You had to, like, wade through sewage. And uh, women, and I don't mean my wife in particular here, but women in general, wear the most ridiculous shoes. You know, they have these shoes that are called flats. They're basically slippers, only without the support that men's slippers have. <laughs> and they just walk down the street with this, it's like wearing nothing. You know, but they don't want to wear army boots, you know, or something that's really strong and secure, you know. So she was wearing sneakers, but the sneakers have holes in them. and they, uh, It was really horrible. She was really upset. Anyway, we get to the turnoff, and the turnoff is closed because they're doing construction, so we had to continue down into the shook. And um, uh, further down into the shuk, and we turned in, and okay, we got to the kaisal, and we said we're going to walk back through the shuk. And as we walk through this uh, other exit, we come back, and I see the shuk right in front of us. So I said, okay, we we'll go this way. My wife says, I'm pretty sure we came down the stairs. And I said, no, 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 the shuk is right here. <laughs> You know, say anything with enough confidence, and even if people know that you're wrong, they will believe you. <laughs> so my wife, my wife says, okay, anyway, it turns out that the Arab shook is much larger than we were aware of. <laughs> I didn't know there was a drugstore, you know, in the middle of the Arab shook. I, they were selling clothing, there was toy stores. Evidently, we were in a different section of the shook than we had ever been in before. And although my wife was pretty confident on the regular, you know, shook, this was, we didn't know where we were. I still don't know where we were. Anyway, so, uh, but it goes on for a very long time. <laughs> we didn't see so many from people or police around anymore. And uh, my wife was kind of nervous. And uh, fine, eventually we found our way back. We found, uh, found signs towards the... Uh, towards the uh, Shar Yafa, the Jaffa Gate. But we also saw signs for Shar Shechem, which we don't usually go through. <laughs> and uh, eventually we made it back. Well, it was kind of scary. And I'm not worried. I'm worried for my wife. I'm not worried for me. Because um, Orlovskis never die in dramatic ways. We just don't. We don't die in plane crashes. Uh, that's why during COVID, I knew I wasn't going to die of COVID. We don't die in pandemics. We don't, we don't get killed in terrorist attacks. We die from diabetes and heart disease. That's how Orlovskis have gone for hundreds of years. <laughs> we don't die. We just, we fade away. We wither. <laughs> My mother made it till 89 in terrible health. She had heart failure for 20 years. She was just, she was a wreck, you know? And that's how we all go. We, we slowly fade away. <laughs> but my wife, I don't know, you know. She's, she's a big sadekist, you know. She might be uh, right for something to happen, chas for shalom, you know. But she was really nervous. And I said, there's nothing to be nervous about. Because getting nervous doesn't help you. Either we're going to get killed or we're not going to get killed. It's really very simple. There's nothing to be afraid of. Fear does not help you. Fear um, comes from one thing, and that is a lack of bitachin. 
Because Baruch Hu runs the world. And you have to take precautions. The Mesil Shasharim says, there is a mitzvah ushmaritem es nafsho seichem. You are required to take uh, care of yourself and make sure that you're not being irresponsible. That's why the people who say, well, I'll throw myself off a building and if I'm supposed to die, I'll die, and if not, I won't. That's not true because the Avera of Shmaratim is Nafsho Seichem alone. The fact that you went against Ratz and Hashem is enough for you to die if you weren't supposed to die. So what can you do? You, you look at a situation and you take all reasonable precautions. Reasonable. So there are people who will never fly the plane could crash. Listen, a lot more people are killed in car crashes than plane crashes. Okay, so I won't, you know, uh, I won't, uh, I won't drive a car. You know, more people die from falling out of the bed than by getting hit by lightning. And yet, in a lightning storm, you see nobody will go outside. So maybe you should put your mattress on the floor and not sleep in a bed because you're taking a risk. Everything's a risk. I'm on a lot of medications because, surprise, surprise, I have diabetes and heart disease. <laughs> Comes with the territory. Anyway, so uh, um, when you open up a box of medication, it comes with a paper, very, very long paper with very small writing, everything that could possibly happen to you. Now, sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. They're obligated to put in all the possible side effects. Um, I was given this one diabetes drug. I don't know what it's called in the market. It's called Amaryl here. And I wake up in the middle of the night with these terrible leg cramps, but like unbearable leg cramps. They won't stop. It's from the medication. It's a side effect. So I stopped taking it. Eventually, I took a lower dose. And every now and then, I wake up at night with a cramp. I can usually walk it off. Sometimes I can't. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. But I need it because my, my blood sugar is too high. I take a, uh, uh, a shot once a week. It's called uh, Ozempic. It makes me nauseous. I can't take the full dose. I just can't. I get so nauseous I can't get out of bed. So, okay, so I take enough that it's having some impact, but I, I don't get the terrible, terrible nausea. I get a little nausea. Yeah. Everything's, everything is a risk factor. You have to take things into account. When, when you go in for uh, surgery or certain procedures and you need anesthesia, they make you sign a release form because there's lots of stuff that can go wrong with anesthesia. I had a colonoscopy and they said, do you want the anesthesia? I said, or what? So there are some people who are afraid of the anesthesia, so they have it without anesthesia. Now, this is about 50 feet of flexible tubing that they're going to put in to uh, an organ of your body where things usually come out and don't go in. And I was like, I'll take my risk with the anesthesia. I met someone, he says his wife was afraid. She did not take the anesthesia. It was unpleasant. It's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> I was actually going for a colonoscopy, and the gastro said, we'll also do an endoscopy. That's where they go into your mouth and go down. I said, okay, but if you're going to use the same tube, do the endoscopy first. They said, no, 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 we have different tubes. <laughs> Just be on the safe side, okay? <laughs> so you always have risks, and you have to take those risks into account. And there's no way to avoid all the risk in your life. So what you have to do in a situation is say, the best I can do is be reasonable. Reasonable. And so there's a difference between being cautious and being phobic. I'm terrified. And listen, we saw this during COVID. Do you ever see people sitting in their car by themselves wearing their mask? Do you ever see somebody walking down the street with nobody around outside wearing a mask? Because people were terrified. Terrified. It was interesting. They did a study. Democrats. They asked Democrats, you know, what percentage of people who get COVID are hospitalized? 
Uh, I think they thought it was something like 80%. The real answer is like 2%. There, there's just fear. Just, just people are terrified. So you have to have talking. HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. And I'm not going to be able to live a life without any risk. I have to take a certain amount of risk. There's going to be a certain amount of calculated risk that I take in. Do I do a procedure? Do I not do a procedure? I remember when my father had his heart attack, they brought him to uh, Mercy Hospital in Rockville Center. That's where the, that's where the ambulance went. And uh, they went to consult with major cardiologists. So there's a place called St. Francis, which is a heart hospital. That's all they do is they specialize in the heart. And uh, they said, listen, they don't have the facilities to deal with your father's condition. You have to move him here. And the doctor in Mercy Hospital said, if you move him, it could kill him. So what do you do? You're going to have to take a, you have to take a chance. There's some risk involved. If I stay here, there's a doctor who says that he's going to die. And if I move him, there's a doctor who says he's going to die. So we asked three major cardiologists. Two said move him, one said keep him. And so two to one, they moved him. They, uh, they did the operation and he, and he survived, thank God. But um, you've got to make a decision. In every situation, you have to make a, a decision. There's going to be risk. And um, which one do you do? Uh, during the Holocaust, the decisions that people had to make, I run them over in my head from time to time. I just can't wrap my head around it. I remember talking to uh, somebody and I said, how come people didn't leave? And he said to me, leave? He says, people were so poor, they didn't have, they didn't have money to put food on their table. How do you think they were, where were they going to go? They were surrounded by anti-Semites all around them. What, what, what do you think? They were going to take a shuttle to the airport and get on a plane? First of all, all the countries were, were closed to them. And every place around them was, uh, was, was anti-Semitic governments. And they had no money. So flee and hide in the, in the forest. Who? This is the young, strong men? What about the children? What about, what about the elderly? Do you abandon them? Or do you stay and you try to, try to work with them? Hope this is going to pass. I mean, nobody could anticipate what was going to happen, obviously. This was so outside of the realm of imagination. No one had ever experienced anything like this with a total genocide. There was no hope, nothing to do. Maybe they would have made different decisions, but where do you go? What do you do? Revarin Cutler uh, did the Vilna Gaon's Geirl. It's a special way of flipping pages in a particular type of uh, Tanakh till you come to a Pasuk. And you count certain parshios and certain psukim, the whole thing. Anyway, he did the goyrel, and it came out, Hashem said to Aaron to go to Moshe. You know that Pusik when uh, Moshe was uh, coming to Mitzrayim. So he says, well, the most famous Moshe alive now is Moshe Feinstein. He's in America, so I'm going to go west. And they said, don't go west. That's where the Nazis are coming from. He says, I'm going west. The other town went east. Turns out that the Nazis circled around. He survived. The others didn't. I have to make a decision. Where do I go? What do I do? Kind of the decisions that you have to make. And do I wait? Do I wait over here? Do I go there? Should I try this? You just get trapped. Okay, but sometimes it's not, it's not that decision. Um, I was in America with my wife, and uh, my nephew was getting married up in Muncie. It was in November, and uh, I left myself uh, an hour and a half to get to Muncie from Long Island. All of a sudden, there was a freak snowstorm. A freak snowstorm in November. 
Okay, so we set out. I was skidding a couple of times, a little scary, but okay. We get onto the highway, we get going a little bit, and then stand still. We're not moving. Turns out there was a 20-car pileup on the George Washington Bridge. Where are you supposed to go? You're stuck. I have to get to Muncie. I'm on an island. Long Island is an island. Yeah? I have to get off. So my brother managed to, you know, get off of where he was, and he got onto the Tappan Zee Bridge. And when he got to Muncie, all the roads were closed because all the cars skidded in the snow, and they were accidents all over the place, and all the roads were closed. He had to turn around. He made it all the way to Muncie. He had to turn around and come home. A lot of the people who made made it to the Hazana just put on snowsuits and, and, you know, and trudged by foot to get to the hall. You, you're stuck in traffic. What do I do? Do I stay on this road? Do I go to another road? I have to make decisions. I can't. So today you have ways. Just do whatever ways tells you to do. You know, don't make any of your own decisions. Ways are good. Ways will tell you what to do. <laughs> if you have ways, uh, you know, it's true. I don't have ways. You know, I have a phone in America that I, I can get ways, but I hear. So nothing I do. I have to make my own decisions. You're stuck in traffic. What are you supposed to do? Where do you go? You know what's going on in the airports now? I spoke about this in a podcast when I was there, and they said they, they, they canceled my flight down to uh, Memphis, back from Memphis. There was one seat on one plane over in Philadelphia. I had to get to Philadelphia to get on this one plane with one seat left. And then when I'm leaving Memphis, there are no flights out any place. Nothing you can do. Come back tomorrow with the witch's broomstick, you know? And you just stop. What do you do? And you hear these stories going on now. Uh, you read in the news. People were sitting on a plane for five hours waiting to take off, and then the crews timed out, so they had to cancel the flight. The people on it. That happened to me once on United, leaving our show. It was delayed so much that the crew timed out. They were, they were still okay, but in the middle of the flight, they would run out, so they would just have to stop and, you know, parachute out, you know, leave you <laughs> and you can't land without the crew because as you're leaving you have to have somebody going bye bye so long thank you thank you for coming bye 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 thank you thank you very much bye bye <laughs> otherwise how can you get off the plane <laughs> oh, i don't have the guts but i always wanted to when we hit the tarmac i wanted to scream out i would like to be the first to welcome you <laughs> the newark airport and the steward said, no, no, I want to be the first to welcome them. No, you're the second to welcome them. I'm the first to welcome them. <laughs> but uh, you're in an airport. What do I do? Should I switch flights? Should I go over here? Do I do this? What do I do? How do I? And you're trapped. You're trapped. And suddenly it's getting close to Shabbos. Do I get off the plane? Do I stay on the plane? Do I take my chances? Oh, my gosh. You know, the decisions. People have to make decisions. Decisions. So you do the best you can. And there's no point in being afraid because being afraid is not going to change the situation. You have to, you have to trust in Hashem. And you have to do the best that you can. And you can rethink situations a hundred times. But how do you know? Rabbi Kinnerik Zatzal was the mashkiach in Chavetz Chaim for many years. He escaped with the mir from Europe. And someone asked him, well, Chanan Vassman was in America when the, when the war broke out. And he went back to Europe to be with the yeshiva. Why did he go? Rabbi Kinnerik said, he really didn't understand, he, nobody knew. He didn't know this was going to be extermination. He thought it was going to be a rough time. If people, World War I 
it was a terrible time for the yeshivas. And they, they were kicked out of here and kicked out of there, and, and the poverty, and it was terrible. But it wasn't extermination. We had, we had no um, basis for understanding this. Nobody knew what was going to happen. It's easy after the fact. Oh, I, I, I'm so smart. Now that I know what happened. So you got to make decisions. I got to, I got to be reasonable. And being afraid doesn't get you anywhere. If, if, if being frightened would help, but you got to make the best decision you can and then trust in Hashem. It's a famous story with the Briscoe Rav that uh, there was bombing going on. And he's in the room and he walks here and he walks there and he's looking around trying to decide what the safest place is. And once he decided, he lay down and went to sleep. That's it. What am I being afraid for? You can, you can, you can uh, paralyze yourself with fear. And so you have to have confidence. I forgot who it was. It was a French philosopher. I, I had written this down once upon a time. I have to look it up. But he says, um, most of the things that kill us are things that never happen. It's worrying. They say, we're concerned there might be this. We want to do a test, you know, and the, until the test results come in, you're so frightened. And then the test results come in, and it's like, you know, it's fine. It's nothing there. And you just, you just worry and worry and worry. I'm so afraid. What if this? What if that? But talk about Hashem. Now, when you go out to battle, it says, don't be afraid. That doesn't mean that you're going to survive the battle. But being afraid is not going to help. There's no guarantee you're going to be successful. You've got to do the best you can. You've got to be reasonable. And you take reasonable precautions and you make reasonable decisions in life and that's how you go about it. And that's the best that you can do. We're living in scary times. No question about it. Iran keeps upping their nuclear weapons and they've been very clear who they want to use it on. Remember the 1960s, during the Tom Lehrer, who uh, used to write uh, funny songs. So he was writing about nuclear proliferation. I just remember he was one verse there. Egypt's gonna get one too, just to use on you know who. So Israel's getting tense, wants one in self-defense. The Lord's our shepherd, says the psalm, but just in case, we better get a bomb. <laughs> So now it's Iran. And they're very clear. If we have a bomb, we want to use it and drop it on Israel. It's amazing. I remember one summer where you could go up north because Lebanon was shelling us and you couldn't, you know, you couldn't go anywhere, you know, near uh, near Gaza because they were shelling us. So you had to, you know, go between uh, Yerushalayim and B'nai Brak, you know, back and forth. That's that's how you spend B'nai Zvanim, you know. A third of the country were in bomb shelters. What can you do? You can be afraid. You can be afraid. I was a fellow from South Africa who we were friendly with. And um, he was in town when the uh, suicide bomber blew himself up near Cafe Ramon. And he got shrapnel in him that they couldn't remove. And, uh, and my kids say, does it hurt? He says, no, but when it gets cold, the middle gets cold inside of my arm. So he says, so do you regret that you came to Israel? And he says, no. You think this wouldn't have happened to me in South Africa? Every bullet has a name. You have to take precautions. You have to be reasonable. There's no way you can stop living. There's no way you can, you can avoid everything. There's no, there's no life without risk. There's always going to be risk. This fellow from South Africa, he left South Africa because he was... Uh, you know, afraid of, of the crime, came to America. A couple of uh, guys attacked him in his house, shot him. Thank God he lived. But uh, where's the guarantee? But Hashem, there's no point in being afraid. You have to have confidence. You have to be uh, uh, sure that a Kodesh Baruch Hu is there. He's watching after you. 
uh, I've had Takufas where my uh, where my career was uh, was on the ropes, and I had people give me suggestions: do this, do that. I said, listen, God knows who I am. He knows where I live. My file is open on his desk. He knows. Uh, you think if I tried this or I tried that, I'll be more successful? You have to have me talking. I told the story. Uh, my son had a very, very long list of what he was looking for in a shidduch. And I said, listen, you got to do a You know? He says, I am. I, I have bitochen and I daven. And I said, shtadlis. I said, look, there aren't many girls out there that you're looking, like the one that you're looking for. He says, but Abba, I only need one. <laughs> Hashem, he found her. Because <laughs> he had bitochen. Being afraid. Not going to help. So that's what we have to do. We have to, we have to be confident as we go into difficult, difficult times. This is a difficult time. All the things that are going on around the world, it's scary. It's scary. One thing you should do is not watch the news. It doesn't help. <laughs> and the other thing is, you have to know, because Baruch Hu runs the world. You have to have confidence and you have to be sure about your relation with Hashem and that's what you should focus on. And that brings us to the question and answer portion of the Rabbi Olavsky show. Anonymous asks, what do I do if I impulsively get angry? How do I stop? Well, speaking as someone who has an anger problem, I was born angry. Midos are something that you're born with. And uh, I was born with anger. I had to work on it a lot. The thing that I found that was very interesting is, I remember seeing this in one of the Muslims firm, that when you get angry, it's like a spark. And if there's no fuel, then the spark goes out. The spark itself goes away. You may not have that control because of your midos, that when you see something, you go, the question is, do you give that fuel? Do you let it get going? Stop. The Ramban, and then Geras Ramban says, uh, shtika is a very important thing because it saves you from kas. Don't say anything. If you're angry, walk away. Walk away from the situation. You don't have to respond. You don't have to say anything. Yeah? You have to, you have to calm yourself down. That's very important. So do not give fuel to the fire. The more you give to it, the worse that it is. Anonymous asks, in most cases, how come you find that kids, especially teenagers, get along with grandparents better than parents? It's simple. Because grandparents don't have uh, any responsibility. <laughs> I mean, it used to be that way. Yeah? Parents have the job to raise the kid. If the Grandparents give the kids uh, candy, give them soda with caffeine. They don't have to stay up all night when the kid is going crazy from a sugar high or a caffeine high. The parents have to deal with it. Uh, grandparents can be much more relaxed because they're not responsible to raise the children. Parents have to raise the children. Rabbi Ari Khan once made a very interesting uh, observation. He says, in Judaism, God is our father. In Christianity, he's our grandfather. Christianity, God doesn't have any expectations of you. It's all love. It's all this. He doesn't care what you do or what, what happens. But a parent is worried. You understand? A parent who says to a kid, hey, you don't have to go to bed. You don't have to take a bath. You can eat all the candy you want. You don't have to go to school. Social services will take the kid away because that's called neglect. It's not called being a parent. A parent has an obligation to raise the kid. Grandparents don't. So grandparents aren't as invested, and so it's easier for them to be able to be uh, less involved. Parents, parents not only are worried about the kids, but also they're the ones who are held responsible when a kid does something wrong. When a kid is crying on an airplane, it's the parent's problem. When a kid is in the supermarket having a temper tantrum, it's the parent's problem. Anonymous asks, the Rav has a reputation for being funny. Is it ever hard to be funny? Does this ever cause a pressure to be funny when you're not interested? So, uh, I, I, uh, speaking on a personal level, my father told me 
from the time that I was little, that you're a lo yitzloch and you're never going to succeed. And if I don't take care of you, you will starve to death. And that's true, by the way. <laughs> I believe that. Anyway, so my father believed it was possible to come up with a system to win at dice. And he spent the last years of his life trying to come up with a system on dice. And he would always tell me, I'm going to leave this to you, my dice system. This way, whenever you need money, you could just go to Atlantic City and you could gamble for a few hours and you'll be able to make a parnosa. I'll leave the business and the house and everything to the kids, but I'll leave you my dice system. <laughs> he never figured out the system, you know. So, uh, so I got left some Yerusha. <laughs> but I, I said, my father in heaven said the same thing. You're a low yitzloch, and if I don't take care of you, you'll never be able to do anything. So he gave me a different matana. He made me funny. Um, it's just almost automatic. So sometimes it's gecheshbind. Sometimes I sit down, you figure out a way to... What word is funny? You try different words. You know, I, I know this from comedians. You find certain words. Uh, if you know my why be Jewish, so you know, uh, pestilence. Yeah, I don't know why. Pestilence is a very funny word. <laughs> what do you have to say? Pestilence, and people are already laughing, you know? So uh, it, it's a, a total gift. So um, even when I am speaking seriously, sometimes a joke will slip in. Uh, I had somebody who was very upset at me. He said, it's a Tisha program, and he said, you know, you get up and you tell jokes. I said, I don't tell jokes. It was a very moving thing. And he pointed out this one, this one, this one. There was a few jokes that slipped in without my even realizing it. Little asides. Yeah. So, um, do I have a pressure? Yeah. Yeah, there are some times when I'm giving a shear and I think to myself, this is dull. Now, sometimes the Torah itself is so exciting the way I'm presenting it that I don't have to do anything else. But sometimes I'm giving a public shear, and what, I have four goals when I give a shear. I want to say a chiddush, because I very often have Tamil Chachamim who are listening. I want to say something that's new. I want to be practical. I want to be inspiring, and I want to be entertaining. I want people to walk away and have a good, good time. So I have four goals. And I feel like it's not entertaining enough, so then I, yeah, I, I have to come up with something. But, uh, but if you've ever seen people who try too hard to be funny, it's very sad. And that's why there are certain rabbanim, they don't try to be funny. They're not funny. And uh, they get by with the Torah or with the inspiration or whatever else they do. I happen to have a gift that uh, Kosh Baruch Hu gave me, yeah, to be able to do it. Anonymous asks, how is it for the Rav to move to Eretz in regard to a two-day yantif? Thank you for such a wonderful show. It was fantastic. It was great. Yeah. I'll give you an example. You work very, very hard for the Pesach Seder, and you put everything you have into the Pesach Seder, and you're geschmetted. And the next day, you daven, take a nap, you know, have lunch, uh, have uh, and it's over. In America, you now have to psych yourself up for another Seder. And the sad thing is, you have people who say, oh, I like the second Seder better because I'm too tired at the first one. But the first one is the Arisa. So you really get a feel for what the Torah envisioned when you have a one-day yantif, it, it, it makes you appreciate it that much more. So for me, I found that it added tremendously to my Avodah Hashem. Is it possible to learn the entire Torah? So that's an interesting question. The Rambam, in his introduction, says, you have a mitzvah to learn Torah, to, to learn the whole Torah, which means the mitzvah to learn the Torah Shev and the Torah Shval Peh. So the Torah Shev is very easy. It's Tanakh. 24 books of the Bible. So you know what that is. Um, the Rambam says, Torah Shev Peh is bigger because there's Shas and there's, um, well, he didn't really have the Mepharshim then, you know, but there's all the Halachic uh, Midrashim. Sifra, the Sifri, the Bechilta, yeah. And all of those things that you have to get. For us, 
there's also the the tour and the Shulchan Aruch and to, to be able to get that down and to understand it to get the Torah Shabbat Peh. Um, so the Rambam writes at the beginning of the Mishnah Torah, I'm writing this because this is all you need for uh, for Torah Shabbat Peh. Just learn the Sefer and you'll have all of Torah Shabbat Peh in it. So that was one of the objections people had to the Mishnah Torah. And that's why the Ravid wrote a parish where he argued with the Rambam in order to protect the Mishnah Torah from being this uh, self-contained safer. But, uh, yeah, you can, you can learn the entire Torah. Having said that, of course not. Because <laughs> there's pshatim on top of pshatim and drushes on top of drushes. Uh, so, so, Rabbi Yaisi, Aglili, the Tana said that in the Yam of Torah, I've learned one drop. There's always more, but there's a certain, just like by Torah, there's a definition, there's a definition to Torah Shabbat Peh that a person can learn and needs to learn. Okay, that's it for this, uh, for this episode. If you want to find out more about the show, you can go to my website, rebielowski.com. You can leave a comment. You can sponsor an episode. You can um, uh, have uh, uh, sign up for any of my online shiurim. The uh, tefillah shir is moving along uh, beautifully, and I get tremendous feedback from the participants. It's really adding to their tefillah, they tell me, and I know it's adding to mine, too. Uh, there's two misil shisharim. There's a dafyomi. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to be able to sign up and participate in these shirim. Uh, people ask me, why don't you put the shirim online? I said, because a shir is interactive by definition. I can't give a shir and put it online because it's not, it's not between a, uh, two people. That's what a shir has to be, has to be interactive. Um, and that's it for, uh, for this week. If, uh, Hope to be able to see you at the next one. Until then, I am David Orlovsky, and this is the Rabbi Orlovsky Show.